Before I start off my speech, I'd like to share a story I wrote with all of you here tonight in order to give you a little bit of insight into who I am and what this TED Talk is all about. Don't worry, it won't take long. In the foul, dark depths of an ancient, crumbling dungeon, a knight battles against a fearsome dragon, swinging his weapon wildly in a desperate bid to stay alive. Underneath his heavy, clunky suit of armour, he is sweating profusely, and each time he raises his arms for another useless strike, he can feel the dull ache of fatigue setting deep into his bones. The very earth trembles with the dragon's laughter, cruel and mocking. And beneath his visor, he can feel those eyes of hellfire burning into him, piercing through his very soul. He knows his time is limited, knows that he must act before his nemesis can get in a lucky strike. He never did like this armor, was not made to stomp around under a thousand pounds of crushing weight, but his friends had forced him to don it, insisting that all knights wore armor when they went to save the princess. So he squares his shoulders, sucks in a lungful of hot sulfuric air, lifts his sword and charges the dragon, a fearsome battle cry erupting from deep within. He is a knight, for God's sake, and he will win. That is, until he trips over a pile of glittering gold and goes sprawling amongst a sea of sapphires. His sword flies from his hand, disappearing into an endless sea of riches, and he cracks his head so hard against the precious gems that his helmet just shatters into pieces. The dragon roars with laughter at the puny mortal beneath him. And although the knight is disoriented by the blood pouring into his eyes, he knows the familiar sting of overwhelming shame. He is not a knight, he is a failure. Then the dragon engulfs him in white hot flames and he dies. For most of my school life, this was how I felt about myself. I was the knight clumsy and uncoordinated and trying to fit into a role that I just knew I wasn't comfortable with. And the people that I surrounded myself with, my teachers, my classmates, even some old friends of mine, they were the dragon, ready to destroy me for every mistake that I made. I wasn't stupid, but like everybody else in the world, I had and still have plenty of flaws and a couple of activities that I wasn't exactly the best at. Unfortunately, these flaws were glaringly obvious, so much so that they became all that anybody ever saw of me. This all started when I was a little girl, while I'm still learning to navigate the new and frightening world of school. It was there that I learned rather quickly that I wasn't exactly the best at sports. I couldn't catch or throw a ball to save my life, and my coordination was, and still is, absolutely shocking. Unfortunately for me, School was a huge, sorry, sports was a huge part of school life, a way of making friends and becoming popular. So naturally, because I ran away every time a ball was thrown in my direction, I wasn't very popular. I still have this very vivid memory from primary school of playing sports with my class, as was required of us almost every single day. We were playing rugby, the sport that some New Zealanders watch with an almost religious dedication and naturally, I kept dropping the ball. I tried to catch it, I really did, but every time the ball seemed to just slip through my fingers. Eventually, my team stopped the game to yell at me for being such a terrible player. They called me clumsy, stupid, worthless. To them, I was a failure, and every time I made a mistake, they were sure to remind me of this. Now, as an only child with no siblings to tease me, I never really developed a thick skin, so their insults hit right here. I burst into tears and ran off, believing that I was worthless, unlovable garbage, all because I couldn't catch a tiny little ball. Eventually, my classmates apologized, and I supposedly got over the insults. But for years afterwards, I continued to carry that feeling of worthlessness with me, like a ton of bricks weighing me down. Because I wasn't very good at sports, I wasn't very popular. And because I wasn't very popular, I, my opinion was never valued. And because my opinion was never valued, I came to believe there was no value in my opinion, creating a vicious, never-ending cycle of self-loathing and negativity. And yet, despite the belief that nothing I did was ever good enough, I did discover something that I enjoyed, something that I was genuinely good at. 
something that I actually discovered due to my lack of coordination. Because I wasn't exactly the top athlete or the most social butterfly, I spent a lot of time alone with my thoughts and with my extremely vivid imagination. I could spend hours designing stories and worlds and characters. And whenever I got the chance, I would pull out a book, a napkin, something to write on, so I could put my ideas into words, channeling that creative side of me. Even today, I carry a million half-used pens, and I am never seen without a book in hand, scribbling away in any situation. I loved writing more than anything else in the world, not only because it was something I was good at, but because it was a way for me to voice the thoughts and opinions and ideas that I kept trapped up here. Ideas that I could never voice aloud because I believed that, well, nobody would ever value them. Writing was also a way for me to prove to myself during those particularly trying days that even, that I wasn't completely useless at everything that I did. That even if I wasn't destined to become a sports champion, that didn't mean I was destined to fail at everything else that I tried. That thought was only further backed up down the line when I was diagnosed with a little something called developmental coordination disorder, more commonly known as dyspraxia. Now, for those of you here who don't know what dyspraxia is, I would like to point out that it is not dyslexia or any type of form of it. Dyspraxia is actually a little hard to explain and to pinpoint as it affects different people in different ways. But in its most basic form, dyspraxia is a neurological disorder one that affects the learning processes in one's brain. It can affect social, physical, emotional, and intellectual learning, and affect processes like coordination, organization, literacy, and even speech. For me personally, my dyspraxia affects my organization and my coordination, making seemingly easy tasks like throwing, catching, and walking even more difficult to learn and to process. However, that doesn't mean dyspraxia automatically makes me less intelligent than my peers. All that it really means is that it takes someone like me a little bit longer to process information. That tasks that might seem blatantly simple to you may require more time and energy and effort from me. There's a reason dyspraxia is also known as the hidden handicap. For example, when I was first starting out at school, our teachers would give the instructions to open our desks, take out a book and pen, and turn to page It's a simple enough request right now, most definitely. But back then, my brain was still learning how to open a desk. So I would just sit there, staring blankly at it, and be told off for not following instructions, giving everyone around me the impression that I was a bit slow. I am intelligent, and I still am. But when you trip over your own feet while walking to school, or accidentally smack yourself in the face while talking and gesturing to someone behind you. Others don't tend to see that intelligence. <coughs> However, that isn't the point that I want to make about dyspraxia. My goal here isn't to paint myself as some tragic victim just because I can't catch a ball properly. I do not intend to take a part of who I am and turn it into everything that I am. Do not intend to take that part and turn it into an excuse for my awful catching. In fact, I'm aiming for the complete opposite here. My dyspraxia is indeed a part of me, a part that I cannot change or get rid of. But that doesn't mean I should let it define me or my life or what I choose to do with it. For so many years, I have looked at my dyspraxia and seen only a hindrance, a nuisance, a source of negativity, when instead I should be embracing it as a part of who I am, taking what I often consider to be my biggest flaw and using it as a springboard to launch me to wherever I need to go. There are many, many celebrities who have battled with dyspraxia, same as me, but haven't allowed it to affect them or the choices that they've made in life. People like Daniel Radcliffe, Cara Delevingne, and even Albert Einstein, all of them have or had dyspraxia, but didn't allow it to stop them on their path to greatness. Daniel Radcliffe himself once said to never let it stop anyone as it never held him back. And has anybody here heard of Agatha Christie? Well, this author wasn't diagnosed with dyspraxia, but she was suffering from dysgraphia, meaning her reading and writing skills were absolutely horrible. And yet, despite this, she went on to write amazing works that gained her permanent fame, 
making her well known even to this day. She, ever, everything pointed to a different path for her, but Agatha Christie took the one thing she should have been incapable of doing and made a world famous career out of it. She took what should have been a great obstacle in life and turned it into a stepping stone, something to help guide her in the direction in which she wished to go. And that right there is what I as myself wish to do. If there is a type of person you want to be, or a goal you wish to achieve, or just a place you want to go, then you shouldn't let anything hold you back, least of all yourself. We all have problems in life, obstacles that stop us from reaching that particular goal. But if you really want to reach that goal, if you really try hard enough, then you can. We spend far too much time as a society looking at the negatives in life, looking at what we do not have and what we cannot achieve, rather than what we do have and how talented all of us really are. And that isn't just an optimistic view on life, a hope that I am feebly clinging to. I know from personal experience that if you keep trying and trying and trying, no matter how difficult things in life may become, you will succeed. I myself am personal proof of this, and that is not a narcissistic statement, that is a fact. At the beginning of this year, I decided that I wanted to be the person that I'd always dreamed of being. I wanted to be fit, I wanted to be social, and I wanted to have enough confidence to look in the mirror and say to myself, you know what? I am enough as I am, and my opinion it does have value. And I think I'm doing pretty well in regards to that. I have gone from a girl who, at the age of three, would just sit in the corner and cry because existing was too hard for my dyspraxic brain, to a braver, more confident woman than I could have ever dared to believe possible. Nowadays, I go to the gym, I take kickboxing and dragon boating, I've joined so many social groups, I don't know what I'm doing half the time, and I have the confidence now to step up here and deliver this speech to all of you here tonight. Something that I literally would have never thought possible. Yes, I have dyspraxia. And yes, I'm not the most coordinated being on the planet. But that doesn't mean I have to let that define me. I don't let that have to become all that I can be. Instead, act as like a guiding beacon towards whatever goal that I wish to accomplish. So, for what's next for me in regards to the future, I'm planning on changing how people view me, how they think and feel about who I am. And I want to use my writing skills to do so, no matter how long it may take me. Because although I am learning to embrace not only my dyspraxia, but all of the different parts of me, I'm still not all the way there. I still look in the mirror some days and think those same thoughts, that I am worthless and unlovable, that I will never be enough. <coughs> so I'm going to write my way to freedom, break free of the endless cycle with what I love to do and what I am good at. I'm going to use my creativity to spread my messages, my thoughts, my ideas, sharing them with others through the power of words and the fascinating worlds that they can weave. I want to show others that no matter who you are or who others think you to be or whatever you believe defines you, you are capable of far greater things than you would have ever dared to believe possible. All of you here tonight, one tiny part of yourself does not mean it is the only thing that you can be. Whether that thing be your gender, your race, your sexuality, your age, your disabilities, none of that matters. So many people see me as only the clumsy, quiet idiot in the background, even my own friends. I love my friends, I really do. But some days it feels like all they will ever see of me is this clumsy, uncoordinated mess, and that's, that's all they will ever see. I am so sick of being seen that way, of being judged by a single part of who I am, a part of me that I cannot change or alter. So I'm going to use my writing to express my thoughts to them, to show them that I am so, so much more than just a clumsy, uncoordinated mess, that I am capable of things that they would have never believed possible of me. And then I'm going to turn that same view onto them, Show them that they too should not allow themselves to be defined by what others think of them or by whatever they believe is holding them back. Do you guys remember the night at the start of the story? Well, this time around, he's doing things a little differently. He knows that he was never meant to be a typical knight, that just because other knights went off and wore armor and rescued princesses didn't mean he had to as well. Here's a knight, yes, 
one sworn to defend his people. He is so much more than just a knight, and he is so sick of people taking that single part of who he is and turning it into everything that he is, binding him to these rules and constrictions that just don't apply to him at all. So, before the dragon's disbelieving eyes, he sheds his armor with a sigh of relief, drops his sword with a resounding clunk, and, to confuse the hell beast even further, produces what appears to be a flute. Smiling, the knight lifts the instrument to his lips and begins to play. Enchanted by the wondrous music, the dragon sits down before the knight and listens for hours to the sweet harmonic melodies pouring forth from the mortal sitting at his feet. The two enemies instead become fast friends, something that neither of them had really had before. The dragon, without too much persuading, agrees to give up the princess in exchange for the knight's friendship, something he agrees to as well without too much complaint. The knight has defended his people, but he has done it in his own unique way, not in the way that others believed he should have done. He did not allow himself to be defined by that single part of who he was or by what others believed him to be, and that is something that I myself am trying to do. I am challenging myself to look in the mirror every single day and remind myself that I am not just a 2D character defined by a single action or a single trait, that I am smart and brave and strong. And that's something that I want to challenge all of you here tonight to do as well. Take a look in the mirror when you get home. Take a good long look at yourself and think about all of the amazing things that you have done and all of the amazing things that you can do no matter how big or how small they may be. You'd be surprised at just what you can achieve when you can free yourself of the world's expectations and constrictions. You don't need a miracle to get what you want in life. All that you've ever really needed is yourself. Thank you.